president of the Los Angeles Olympic Organizing Committee, Peter Ubarak. Mr. President, Olympians, our partners and sponsors in the audience, ladies and gentlemen, a couple corrections. I did miss the Olympic team. I tried very hard in, for the 1956 Games, and Mayor Bradley wants you to know that his introduction was also incorrect. He missed being police chief. <laughs> What are the Olympic Games? 150 nations, actually 151, coming to this city for peaceable purposes to take their best youngsters onto fields of play in some third levels of government. We should tell you that we're generating $236 million in direct tax revenue from this Olympic Games into the federal coffers, and we're not asking for anything back. Paul Ziffrin, our chairman, for providing an environment in this country that allow a private sector Olympic Games to work, an environment of cooperation with the private sector and government to make something that everyone here and everybody in this country can rally about. So in 1984, we'll be proud of these United States of America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. President, distinguished guests, there's a kick being here back in the Biltmore Bowl, you know? It's a thrill knowing it's here <laughs> after the rains we've had. And I'm kind of a kind of a kick seeing John Neighbor be master of ceremonies. Does a, a good job, a very bright job. Believe me, San Antonio. He won four medals for swimming in the Olympics, and two this last Tuesday. <laughs> a lot of bright fellows on this committee. I love uh, Peter Uberoff. He's solid Olympic because at the reception before, he was smoking a big cigar and blowing five interlocking smoke rings. <laughs> now, I'm thrilled to be here to help the Olympics, you know, although there are a lot of needy causes. Like as when I came in, there was a fellow out there with his hand out, and I said, Governor, you don't have to do this. <laughs> but I can't wait for the Olympics. It's just going to be wonderful with men battling each other, fighting and competing. And that's just getting out of the airport. <laughs> Now, the Olympics are wonderful. They teach young people to think clean, to play clean, and to live clean, which in election year is going to confuse the hell out of them, I tell you. <laughs> I, just, I, just hope, I just hope the weather is kind, because it hadn't been too kind. I'll tell you, it's been awful. It's the, the lightning is what bothers me. I keep jumping out of bed and taking a bow. <laughs> Actually, I don't mind the rain, but Gene Kelly keeps dancing up the side of my house. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's great. And this is a great, wonderful group here. I really mean that. You know, I, I, can't, um, I can't tell you just how... Um, how this, this group, I don't know how you got here. I guess you treaded water on the way in, I guess. And I hope it stops. I really do, because people have been, uh, there's some nasty events. Of, and I think uh, Tootsie started the whole thing. You know, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. <laughs> Maybe God is sore, you know, that L.A. let Steve Garvey and Ron Say go. I'm not, <laughs> I don't know what it is. Sorry about something. Anyway, I tell you, it was pretty bad out in San Fernando Valley. The water was up some places to the top of the houses, and there was a fellow sitting on top of the house, and the water was just over his feet, and a, and a rowboat came by and said, can we help you? He said, no, I, I made a deal with God. And a little later, the water was up to his chest, and a helicopter came by and said, can we help you? And the fellow said, no, I made a deal with God. 
and a little later he drowned. <laughs> and he went up to heaven. He's looking around. He finally ran into God. He said, what happened? God said, I don't know. I sent a rowboat and a helicopter for you. <laughs> You know that animals, animals can always tell when there's something wrong because yesterday, 40 pairs of animals were trying to get on the queen yacht. <laughs> and I know because my dog and I were in third place. <laughs> I just want to tell you, it's a kick to be here and it's wonderful to see the president again. He looks so marvelous and he's doing such a fine job and it's great to read the paper about how the economic index is coming on. And I've known him so long, and he looks so good. And God, I just hope that I can look that good when I get his age. I mean, <laughs> I'll tell you that. <laughs> and I watch him all the time, you know, and, and, and he's, he's got a great sense of humor, like when, when he was wounded and they took him to the hospital, you know, and he wanted to know if the doctor was a Republican, which I thought took a lot of moxie, you know? <laughs> And I like a president that tells jokes instead of appointing them. And I was saying, <laughs> I, um, I've known him for so long. We, we were very close. We're back to back on the late show. <laughs> and uh, I've known him for a long. In fact, we appeared right here in this bowl for a big, uh, big dinner for Al Jolson about 40 years ago. And uh, I've been a friend of his ever since. You know, a lot of, a lot of presidents, uh, they, that, you pick on president because they're the big man and I do I do a lot of jokes about uh, the Mr. Reagan you know on, on the on on the on the television but he's the one and I've always picked on presidents you know and I was, I hear things like the Democrats who are saying that he, he's using the White House as a stepping stone to get back into pictures but I don't believe that <laughs> I don't believe those things. And I say a lot of those things, you know, and if I said those things in Moscow, I guess I would be a MC at the Siberian Stock Company or something. <laughs> Siberia over there is where they send their people with crazy political ideas. We send ours to Washington, but it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> no, it, it's true. And most, most presidents have been fun. You know, I know that uh, Mr. Ford has always been nice, and whenever he hits me with a ball, he claims he's shooting somewhere else, you know, <laughs> things like that. But uh, it's, it's, it's uh, Mr. Carter wasn't too kind. I said some things about his, him, and uh, he just snapped his fingers, and my cue cards were born again. <laughs> but uh, now I helped, I helped Mr. Reagan during the campaign. I, I went to a couple of spots with him, and in fact, I had a couple of ideas for his, uh, for his uh, cabinet. I wanted Charlton Heston as vice president at that time, because I thought we needed a miracle. And, uh, <laughs> And I wanted Don Rickles as ambassador to Iran. <laughs> can't, you see, can't you see him walking into the Ayatollah and say, look, hockey puck. <laughs> you need a new flea collar. Anyway, the president doesn't need much help. He can get on that television and charm the hell out of you. He makes Dar Dale Carnegie look like Don Rickles, I tell you. He can sell. He could sell in Dotson to Lee Iacocca, I tell you that. <laughs> or a copy of Penthouse to Jerry Falwell. He can really sell. And it's my delight. They asked me just to do five or six minutes. I usually bow for a minute, but it doesn't make any difference. It's a, just a delight for me to have this next chore, ladies and gentlemen, and introduce the President of the United States. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and everyone except Bob on account of I shouldn't have to follow that. <laughs>
He, no, I do thank him, and I thank all of you for a very warm welcome. Members of the Olympic Committee, Reverend Muma, Mayor Bradley, Senator Wilson, John Neighbor, Bob Hope, all the distinguished guests, I have to say one thing about my very good friend and my minister, Don Mumaw. You know he was a linebacker for the Bruins. When I was governor, I took him to a couple of football games in which the Bruins were playing. I thought my playing days were over, but you should sit beside him in a stadium when the Bruins are playing. It gets to be a pretty physical experience. But I'm pleased that my pleasant but official duties of welcoming the Queen permitted me to be here with you today. I must admit that every time I visit California, it gets harder and harder, and Pete, you're gonna find this out, to get on that plane and go back east. Even with the bad weather out here, it's better than most parts of the world. A few weeks ago, we had a blizzard in Washington. Some of the Californians on my staff learned what it means to be snowed in. Yet even when the temperature was below freezing and snow covered the ground, believe it or not, joggers were still seen making their daily run. Although those hardy souls certainly had more tenacity than most, they represent a dramatic change of attitude that's taken hold over the last two decades. Today, as never before, Americans are actively engaged in personal exercise and physical fitness programs, a health trend we should all encourage. Lately, I haven't had as much time for my equestrian pursuits. There's no bridal path at the White House, but I work out on a regular basis because they do have a gym upstairs there. And uh, I'll have to admit, I don't have the same caliber of adversary as our Olympic athletes, but it does help to stay in shape when you're facing the fighting Irish in a form of Tip O'Neill. <laughs> Incidentally, I have to inject a little news item right here, though. Uh, that, was, that was a joke. Seriously, I want, to, uh, <laughs> I want to be serious a little bit about some of our sports back there. The Ways and Means Committee, the all-powerful committee at the House of Representatives, in an overwhelming bipartisan move, has voted 32 to 3 in favor of and sent out to the floor the Social Security Compromise Plan. And that was Chairman Dan Rostenkowski and then the ranking minority leader, Barbara Conable, and the sub-chairman, Jake Pickle. And I hope that the full House and Senate will follow their lead and protect Social Security for years to come uh, by showing the same bipartisanship. And this will also guarantee, I think, if they will continue on that, a solid economic recovery. Uh, now, I know we've got a good number of Olympians with us today. Some have been, for one reason or another, introduced. But I just wondered if all present and past of the Olympic athletes who are here today could stand up so that we could give them a round of applause for what they've done, what they're doing, and going to do. The truth is, I just really wanted to see them all. Well, you know, when I was a bit younger, being involved in athletics as I was, I, like so many others, dreamed about the Olympics. I didn't get very close to them. The closest, I think, was at the University of Illinois. It was the state track and field championships for the high schools of Illinois. I was on the 880 relay. And um, I can remember handing off the baton to our anchor man. We didn't win as there was a young fellow that was also anchor man on a high school team from Chicago. Ralph Metcalf went on to win gold medals in 32 and in 36 in the Olympics. He and Jess Owen were very, very special to my generation. I can remember what a great source of pride it was when they won that day in Berlin and Adolf Hitler with his Aryan supremacy stupidity had to stand up and swallow that stupidity when the gold medals were placed around the necks of some of our fine black athletes. Mm. 
Ralph Metcalf and Jesse Owen were much more than great athletes. They were great Americans. Ralph went on to become a member of the United States House of Representatives for a number of years. Sports in general, and the Olympics in particular, bring us together as nothing else. One of our first great sports heroes was John L. Sullivan, heavyweight champion of the world at a time in this country's history when there was a great discrimination against the Irish. And when Jim Corbett finally took his title as heavyweight champion of the world, Sullivan, I think, won the hearts of his fellow countrymen when he said, I have fought once too often, but if I had to get licked, I'm glad it was by an American. How can we ever forget the moment when another boxer, a young man, George Foreman, from an underprivileged background, proud to be representing our country at the Olympics in Mexico City at a time when there was great, uh, great ill feeling and the age 30 was a barrier to, uh, to some in this country and all. And then he, how he had it throughout the fight and where he had it, I'll never know. But when victory was announced and he stood in the middle of that ring and suddenly unfurled a small American flag and stood with that flag raised. It was a thrill, I think, for everyone in our country. I say it was in the turbulent 60s. He showed us that whatever divides us, it's not as strong as what keeps us together. And then there were those young men at Lake Placid. That team that their coach told them before the game, before they went out to meet the Russians. And he said, you were born for this moment. This is your moment. And I think we'll never forget the picture of those young fellows after that, na that victory there on the ice, those young Americans, when they certainly were not the favorite to win by a long ways, but they did. Win or lose, we've always been proud of our athletes, and I think that all of you, especially you here at the front table, Don Miller and Peter Uberoff, George Moody, Don Krivelon, can be rightfully proud of the part that you're playing. You and others who are providing the support for our team, as well as those who are helping to organize the event itself, deserve more than a word of thanks. And I'm happy today to be able to extend it to you on behalf of the American people. I appreciate the magnitude of the task that you've taken upon yourselves. The price tag for selecting, training, and supplying your Olympic team, as you told us, $77 million. Raising that money and making sure that it's spent effectively is an enormous responsibility. And this year, Americans are not only supporting their own team, but they're also responsible for the games themselves. Today, you're part of a noble American tradition of direct citizen involvement. If it weren't for citizens like you who take it upon themselves to support our athletes, the American team would be left wanting, as it has many times in the past. Unlike some other countries, American teams, as you well know, and as have been told here today, do not receive government grants or federal tax dollars. And uh, that gladdens my heart, not just because we've got financial problems in Washington, but because I just think that there are a lot of things that we were in danger of drifting into a feeling in this country that, well, it was always government's turn to do it, let government do it. And we were beginning to lose, perhaps, that wonderful do-it-yourself thing that has always characterized the American people. So I know that you're going to get the job done. The task of organizing the games is worthy of Yankee ingenuity. With that operating budget, as you've been told, of nearly a half billion dollars, Next year's games will show the world what Americans without government subsidy can accomplish. These games will rep reflect the excellence, the hospitality, and the spirit of accomplishment that are so much a part of our way of life. I understand that there are already signs of the swelling public support. The corporate community, as evidenced by you who are here today, has stepped forward in a big way, and among other things, financing specific construction projects needed for the games. And I think we're all grateful for this example of corporate citizenship. One of the top priorities of our administration has been to encourage the American people as individuals, as organizations in private and in business life to get more directly involved in getting things done, solving problems and helping each other. Private initiative is our most precious American resource. And it's as alive today as it was when 
Our ancestors used to join in barn raising parties when it was needed for a neighbor. Preliminary figures for 82 suggest that even in a time of severe recession, Americans were still willing to contribute generously to worthwhile and charitable causes. Last year, and we all know how bad last year was, and again, these are just preliminary figures, Americans as individuals contributed $48.7 billion, an increase of 9.4% over 1981. Corporate giving was $2.9 billion, and that was 1% higher than 1981, but in 1982, corporate profits were down 22% from what they had been in 1981, and yet they still improved their contributions. Well, private sector initiatives succeed just as these Olympics will succeed because of thousands and thousands of individual efforts. The Olympic effort has the support of people like Jim McKay, Rune Arledge, and yes, Howard Cosell. <laughs> I realize there's a theory that good news isn't good for the ratings, but I only wish that everyone in the media could appreciate as much as all of you here do the voluntary efforts being taken by the American people. So I suggest that April 17th through April 23rd, it's National Volunteer Week, that during that week maybe the America's heroic private sector initiative efforts should be given the attention they deserve. And then if the ratings go down, why they can go back to the bad news. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, you know, there's something that's not all too bad about that. I think it's great that bad news is considered, or the bad events and happenings are considered worthy of news. And the good deeds are so commonplace in America that they're not news. And so they don't get the attention. But maybe we'll just have a few days and do that. There isn't any shortage of good stories. Bill Verity, who headed my private sector initiatives task force, told me about Monroe, Ohio, a town with a losing high school football team. And then they hired a new coach. And he suggested the team's poor showing was, simply put, because its players just weren't as physically strong as their adversaries. And he recommended building a physical conditioning facility, complete with weight training equipment. Well, the school board reported they just couldn't afford the $50,000 needed for the project. Instead of giving up, the hometown barber, a live wire named Robert Yeltsler, was brash enough to say, why well, before I came in here today, talked to Governor Duke Majin. And I know that the request is coming to expand the disaster area of California quite sizably and include a number of the counties that have been hard hit uh, in this recent storm. And I was pleased to tell him that old hard-hearted me, we will expedite the answer to his request. But it's times of trouble that can bring out the best in people. We're seeing that all over Southern California. These organizations are, of course, based on voluntary support and represent the best, again, that there is about this country. I hope that when the winds stop and the floodwaters recede, people here in California especially will remember what's been done and, even more important, will remember to do their part to support these private efforts. The job they've done in the last few days is really something to be proud of. Our country has been blessed with people who understand that whether or not their community will be the decent place they want it to be depends on them. And we're here today in that same spirit. Millions of young people will be watching the games, as you've been told, young people from all over the world, as well as our own children, the fiber of tomorrow's America. And I know we won't let those kids down and we won't shortchange our country by doing anything less than a first-class job. In a free society, it all depends on us. So I just want to, whatever I can say, to encourage everyone to do what they can to support our team, the American Olympic team. Years after his triumph in Berlin, Jesse Owens was asked if the playing of the national anthem at the Olympic victory stand ceremonies should be discontinued. You remember, it wasn't too many years ago when there were people talking about things like that. that playing the national anthem might be provocative. Well, all Americans should hear his answer. He said, it's a tremendous feeling when you stand there and watch your flag fly above all the others. For me, it was the fulfillment of a nine-year dream 
and I couldn't forget the country that brought me there. And I thank you for letting me be a small part of this ceremony here today. And Bob, I can't resist telling a little story here that also has to do with uh, some gentlemen who, three of them arrived at the pearly gates together and were informed that there was only room for one. And they had decided inside that the man who participated in the oldest trade or profession would be the one that was allowed to come in. And a gentleman stepped forward and said, well, we know that the Lord made Adam and then created Eve out of a rib from Adam and that took surgery and I'm a surgeon, so I guess it's me. But before he could move in, the second one said, wait. He said, before the Lord did that, he worked six days. Everything was chaos, and he worked six days and created the earth. And so he said, that makes him an engineer, and I guess that calls for me. And the third one stepped up and said, I'm an economist. Where do you think they got all that chaos? <laughs> I think of that story many times <laughs> when news and memorandums reach my desk and recommendations. Anyway, again, thank, thank you for letting me participate and thank you all for what you're doing. God bless you all. Obviously, words alone are not enough to express our appreciation. In the field of athletics, the Olympic athletes exchange lapel pins. It's a symbol of their friendship and camaraderie. We would like to give you on one of each of the sports lapel pins. The Collector's Series, number one in the Collector's Edition of the lapel pins for the 1984 Olympic Games. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. You very much. Please remain in your seats until the head table has been excused. Thank you for coming.